Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, I, I am so pleased to introduce Marco Del Giucci uh, to you. Um, um, Marco got his, um, his degrees from the University of Turin, and he is currently an associate professor in the Department of Psychology, University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. Um, I started reading his work um, about a year ago. The, uh, some of the, uh, his approaches to an evolutionary understanding of psychopathology have really been illuminating for me in the whole idea of life history theory, which perhaps we'll hear about in his presentation. He also wrote this um, very interesting book, Evolutionary Psychopathology, that I've enjoyed very much, and I recommend it to you if you have interest in this area. So um, without further ado, I'm so pleased to present Marco. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? OK. Well, thanks for the book plug. That was, <laughs> that was a treat. Um, OK, this is a, a big picture talk. And the topic of this talk is the perennial quest for integration in psychopathology, the study of mental disorders. And the state of the art is, uh, well, we, we live in interesting times, because we, of course, mean the DSM is the main source of classification and kind of ordering for mental disorders. Uh, that's, uh, you know, lots of constraints on the DSM, but the taxonomy of DSM has a, has a number of limitations. One is it tries to be a theoretical, which means by almost by definition in the long run it's going to be unsatisfactory. Um, many of the, the, the diagnostic categories are highly heterogeneous, and everybody knows that. The problem is what to do about it, and, you know, how to move just beyond the, the fact and, and try to uh, integrate in a way that turns the heterogeneity into something useful. Uh, and then one thing about DSM that's really uh, a big limitation is the lack of any account of the large-scale patterns. And if you uh, study psychopathology, you know that well, you know, comorbidity is just the rule. Um, disorders happen in big clusters. Uh, it's very rare for people to have just one particular diagnosable uh, mental disorder. So you would really like uh, a diagnostic system to have an account of this, uh, of this patterning, and uh, this is not coming from DSM. There's alternatives. People are, are working hard on alternative approaches. One is the, um, well, this, there was the add your own limitation to the list because everyone likes to hate the DSM. Although, I mean, the, the, the alternatives are uh, still in the infancy in a way. So on the one hand, you have the, the RDOC, there's one uh, one possible approach, and that's a bottom-up approach. You're, what you're trying to do really is uh, try to forget about the categories, work on brain circuits with identifiable functions, and try to reconstruct psychopathology from the bottom-up. Um, now, this is a very interesting project. Uh, there are some limitations, too. One big limitation right now is that the, well, the coverage of functions and circuits is very patchy. So last time I checked, uh, for example, you didn't have uh, anything for mating and sexual behavior. It's kind of, hmm, interesting. <laughs> That's not, you know, it's not like animals have, uh, well, sex and, and, and reproduction and mating. I mean, that's, and if you look at human psychopathology, uh, mating and sexuality, they're kind of intertwined with all sorts of behaviors. So the coverage clearly comes from a selection of behaviors that come from laboratory work. And so uh, we'll see, you know, it's going to take some time before the coverage becomes uh, adequate. The other thing is, it's really hard to do this work completely bottom up. So the idea of starting from circuits and recovering something that will at some point replace the existing taxonomies, uh, I mean, it's obviously going to be a very, uh, very long-term uh, project. I, I'm a bit skeptical that this is going to succeed purely from a bottom-up perspective. Actually, I think, uh, you, you know, if you can illuminate this kind of bottom-up work with some uh, top-down principles, that's going to work much better. So that's partly uh, what I tried to do in my work. Uh, the other, uh, well, another big contender is transdiagnostic models, go under a number of different names, but the, uh, they come from uh, essentially a factor analysis of symptoms and, and disorder scales. What you get there is really an attempt to, uh, to get an account of the big picture. So this is really a top-down approach. Uh, and what you get usually is uh, you identify big factors. You know, it's a dimensional model. You get an internalizing and an externalizing factor of psychopathology. And more recently, uh, people have found a robust and pre-reproducible 
a general factor of psychopathology. So the idea is some people seem to be just predisposed to pretty much any kind of disorder at the same time. There seems to be a general factor there. It's been replicated a number of times in all sorts of you know, age groups. So it's, it's definitely a statistical phenomenon. And what, if you look at the correlates of this P factor, you find um, an assortment of things from low IQ and reduced neural integrity, uh, some personality traits like low agreeableness, conscientiousness, high neuroticism, and it's correlated to also childhood adversity and socioeconomic uh, difficulties and so on. Um, that's a very interesting pattern. Uh, you also find it in genetic data that's relevant. So it's not just in the phenotype. You, you find a P factor also in the genetic, you know, in the GWAS genetic correlations. So there seems to be something important to explain here. Now this, Trans diagnostic models started from this big internalized and externalized distinction. They've become more refined. This is the current kind of uh, the uh, big player, uh, this new high top model of psychopathology, where you have a, you know, uh, a hierarchy of layers, starting from these higher order dimensions, the P factor on top of it, going down to uh, classy internalizing, externalizing, thought disorders, and then uh, refinements that lead you to specific categories of disorders. Now, um, this is doing you know, what, something that other approaches are not doing, which is an efficient description of the large-scale structure of psychopathology. So there's a good thing. Um, also, uh, people working in transdiagnostic models are um, linking, uh, making an explicit effort to link these psychopathological dimensions to normal variation in personality. So there's value in that too. At the, on the other hand, so one potential problem is this model is largely inductive. Um, most of it really comes from uh, analysis of correlations among, among symptoms and, uh, or disorders or syndrome scales. Uh, so you really, you don't have a, a strong theory of why things should go together the way they go. It's really mostly you know, inducted from correlations. And I'm going to argue that this is actually a key, you know, um, key limitation that really prevents you from figuring out some things. Um, that's going to be the, uh, the end of the talk, so creating a bit of suspense here. All right. Uh, the other problem I see with current versions of the transdiagnostic models in the high top is that what they do, I mean, they, they, they provide an account of the upper level. So, you know, what happens between disorders and syndromes, the correlations between symptoms and disorders and syndromes. But if you go down the hierarchy, you will see that at some point you basically get the same DSM categories. So, it does, you know, this, this model is a good job of telling you what's happened at the, at the at level above the categories, uh, but they take the categories more or less at face value. So uh, they don't really address, at least at this point, the problem of heterogeneity within the categories. Uh, it's mostly uh, above the categories and not below. All right. Now this is the, uh, the view from, uh, let's say, mainstream psychopathology. And the view from evolution is that, uh, well, as usual, you want to take into account uh, a number of, of potential explanations of what you're, uh, what you're looking at. This is, I mean, classic. You probably encountered this before, this Tim, Banger, uh, Tim, uh, Tim Bergen's uh, four questions about biological uh, processes. And the idea here is they can approach any biological system from at least four angles. And two of them are called proximate, so the, the mechanism, how does it work? and how this develop over the lifetime of one individual. And then you have more the evolutionary level of, uh, of questioning, where you can ask questions about phylogeny, so how the traits or the mechanisms develop not over one lifetime, but over the evolution of a species. And then the, uh, a critical quadrant over there, where you ask the questions about adaptation and maladaptation. This is the, the specific contribution of, uh, of an evolutionary approach, the adaptive quadrant here. And right now, I try to, to map current, let's say, emerging approaches to psychopathology. Developmental psychopathology, of course, is mostly concerned with development, and it bleeds into mechanism a little bit. Um, computational approaches, which I'm very fond of, and of course, they have incredible problems, but right now, currently, as the field uh, exists right now, they're mostly uh, restricted to, to asking questions about how things work, and they don't really ask questions about why things work uh, the way they do in terms of adaptation and maladaptation. Uh, the RDoC, is, is a bit of a hybrid because it, you know, inevitably it does address some questions about function, but that's not the primary focus. In evolutionary psychopathology, I mean, right now it complements the current emphasis on the mechanistic and approximate level by adding consideration of the, uh, of the ultimate or, or evolutionary questions. Uh, with 
not enough work probably done on the on the phylogenetic uh, quadrant, but that's the the situation. And th there's been, you know, finally, I have happy to say uh, it's starting to get more traction. Although, of course, it's going to take um, some time. But um, so the I'm just going to to give you a few. Um, just a very broad brush overview of the principles of evolutionary psychopathology as a branch of evolutionary medicine, as a broader, um, as a broader field. So here's a very nice uh, list. You can really distill a short list of big reasons of why bodies and minds are vulnerable to disease uh, and disorders. And uh, this is by what Brandy Nessie, in a recent book on psychopathology, he's a, one of the founders of the field of evolutionary medicine. And he is, you know, this is a, a really nice uh, starting point. So there's just a handful of reasons why we are vulnerable to disease. And one is mismatch, uh, things that were uh, working correctly or, or evolutionarily adaptive in a certain environment as the environment changed. And of course, we have uh, humans have changed their environment very quickly and very extensively in a short time. You can, uh, you can generate mismatches uh, in modern environments. Uh, infections are probably more involved in the genesis of mental disorders than a lot of people uh, believe. And of course, uh, you're always in, in a kind of a losing war with uh, pathogens and uh, bacteria and viruses. Because as we kind of know uh, very acutely now, evolve fast and uh, they're kind of ahead of you in the evolutionary game. Uh, there are constraints, like hard constraints on what evolution can do. So, you know, it would be nice to have, you know, wheels and wings, <laughs> kind of practical. You know, that there are constraints, you know, biomechanical constraints and physiological constraints that you can just, you can't break. And then there are the soft constraints. There are trade-offs. If you try to optimize an organism to do something well, uh, you're usually going to sacrifice some other aspects of function. And this is something, I would think that this is probably the single biggest contribution of, of an evolutionary approach to medicine. Because in medicine, uh, thinking in terms of trade-offs between function is something that very few people uh, do systematically. It's like a mid, really missing thing. Um, the reproduction is one specific instantiation of this, is that uh, organisms, uh, the ultimate criterion for the success of organisms from an evolutionary perspective is really reproduction or replication uh, of their genes. And that's what natural selection will tend to maximize over time. And reproduction can actually trade offs with health. So the, the implicit kind of naive idea that the uh, outcome of evolution is healthy, organi healthy and happy organisms, that's not exactly the way it works. Uh, whenever reproduction you know, clashes with happiness and health, you can expect selection to, to prefer those. Um, and so you might actually have some behaviors and syndromes that represent strategies that are adaptive from a biological point of view, even if they have cost for health and well-being. And, and then there's the problem of defensive responses. Of course, we know, uh, I mean, psychologically, that's, that's still partly an unexplored uh, area. But uh, defenses are weird. Uh, Think of, say, fever and vomiting. You know, they have some features that make them tricky to analyze because they're usually aversive. Okay, um, they uh, they can actually put you in serious danger. So too much vomiting, you know, or or you know, vomiting, fever, diarrhea can actually kill people. Okay, but those are not those are not symptoms. Uh, vomiting, fever, and diarrhea are defenses of the organism against infection that have high costs. So defenses can be aversive, can have high costs, and uh, for reason we're going to see in a minute, they actually might be designed by evolutionary processes to uh, be prone to misfiring and, and, uh, and, for example, being hyperactive. And so if you translate that to the psychological domain, you can think of a lot of, you know, when you're studying things like uh, depression and anxiety and panic, where there's an obvious defensive component or protective component, it gets really tricky to discriminate between, let's say, healthy and adaptive versions of those defenses and what's genuinely maladaptive. Okay, so now you can, uh, these are general statements, you can refine them and go a bit deeper into them. So for example, you know, one instantiation of this would be a cliff-edged fitness function. When you have an asymmetry in the fitness cost and benefits of a certain trait, so you know, it pays so the direction of selection for a trait, which is going to benefit you up to a point, but then too much of a trait may actually have catastrophic consequences. And in this condition, you can predict that evolution will still select for a distribution of the trait in which a, a proportion of the population will be maladaptive, okay? Just because of the asymmetry in the fitness function. There's another uh, interesting principle 
that comes from this, this approach is so-called smoke detector principle. This is actually a straightforward Bayesian uh, application to, uh, to the regulation of defenses. And the idea is that depending on things like uh, how costly the defense is compared with what it's trying to avoid, okay, uh, and also the, um, the, um, whether the threat you're trying to protect yourself against is a common threat or, or, a, rare, or a rare threat, uh, you can actually calculate what's the optimal design for a defense. And when you know, the defense is, for example, aversive and costly, but still way better than actually failing to protect yourself against something, uh, and the threat is, is sufficiently common, you can actually select for a whole lot of false positives, which means your defenses may actually be designed to overreact a number of times. And fever is probably designed this way, which is why uh, you can take you know, anti-fever medication and survive. Okay, because if fever was critical for your survival every time, then you wouldn't be taking uh, anti-inflammatories in the way we take them. Okay, then there's a little debate whether that's actually have a little detrimental effect. But by and large, you know, defenses are regulated often in a way that makes you know sometimes safe to suppress them. Uh, but that's, this has really important implication for understanding uh, <clears throat> disorders where defenses are uh, the central. Uh, the central mechanism that's, that's going on. Okay, so this is the, just a couple of examples. Expand it and refine it. And this is a taxonomy we proposed uh, with Bruxelles based on this kind of reasoning. You can actually now uh, start thinking about a bit systematically about <laughs> reasons why organisms may, uh, you know, and humans in particular, may find themselves in, with undesirable conditions. And which undesirable, I mean, you know, stuff you, you want to get rid of uh, pretty much, doesn't necessarily mean that they are actually maladaptive or dysfunctional. So the, and if you take an evolutionary perspective on uh, conditions that might be undesirable, you see a big spectrum that goes from, you know, left, uh, <clears throat> dysfunctional mechanism, so uh, what's sometimes called harmful dysfunction, and this is disorders in, a, in the strictest sense possible. So there's a mechanism designed to do X, and it's not doing X anymore. So it's failing to perform the, the evolved function. On the other end of the spectrum, you have things that are actually functional mechanisms doing their job. So everything is, you know, nothing is malfunctioning. It's actually maybe still adapted in the modern environment. But it has consequences that we don't like. For example, you may think, of, again, uh, for example, antisocial or exploitative social strategies, uh, aversive defenses that are, that are um, horrible to have, but they still play an adaptive value. Uh, up to just, uh, for example, self sacrifice you can think that sometimes organizations will be selected to actively sacrifice their own well-being and their health in order to, uh, to get some evolutionary advantage and so on. In the middle, you have another um, rich menu of options from evolutionary mismatches to all sorts of things that happen as maladaptive outcomes of adaptive mechanisms. And for a number of reasons, even mechanisms that are adaptive and well-designed uh, will from time to time uh, yield maladaptive outcomes. Either because you know, learning mechanisms can sometimes learn uh, the wrong thing. Uh, developmental you know, strategies may actually fail sometimes to match it to the environment in the correct way. Uh, you can think of some behavioral strategies of things that increase the risk you're taking. And of course, if you increase the risk, you also increase the possibility that you will fail. And so all, for all those reasons, you can have, uh, oops, doo -doo, adaptive mechanisms that generate maladaptive outcomes. So one message from this, I think this figure, I, I like to show it every time I can. Because one uh, misunderstanding about the evolutionary approach is that it will give you just one way to think about disorders. And uh, the reality is pretty much the opposite. Actually, from an etiological perspective, so perspective of the origin of disorders, an evolutionary approach really, I think, reveals uh, an incredibly rich menu of possibilities um, that's actually probably richer than any other uh, mainstream theory of psychopathology, for example. So <clears throat> it's an approach that really diversifies the options. And the, these are not even mutually exclusive. And there might be complicated cases. And in some cases, disorders may actually, what we identify as one disorder, may actually mix up different things with different origins. So this is, I think, a, a deep way for thinking about disorder. It's still not a way to integrate disorders um, and, and get a big picture description of what's going on with psychopathology and the big picture pattern. So how do you, yes? Uh, 
हाँ Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Okay, there's, um, see, let me see if I understand the question right. So it's, uh, you're asking me how this translates at the level of this evolutionary genetics, right. basically. Yeah. Yes, okay. We all, there's, a, there's a number of options there too. And the main ones are, um, well, one thing is mutations happen. And that's a big, you know, big factor in not all mental disorders, but quite a few of them. So uh, even if you have selection against certain variants, you still have mutations, you know, pumping in maladaptive variation. And, and most mutations are going to be uh, deleterious, so it's harder to break things than to improve them. So, and sometimes you will have mutation with severe effects, so with you know large deleterious effects. So those are going to be uh, quickly selected against, but they keep happening. So mutation selection is one thing. Um, the other main explanation is uh, balancing selection. So you might actually have different variants where uh, things that are selected for, so the gen genetic variants that are selected for, in, say, one environment or in one place or time or some individuals, they are selected against in other individuals or other times or places. Um, and then you have um, cases in which, for example, you can think of, uh, well, the cliff edge fitness function is one example in which the distribution, you know, Individual genes will just shift you a little bit along a distribution, and it, generally speaking, it pays to be higher on a trait rather than lower. But you can have too much of a trait. And so, for example, if there's, uh, I'm going to mention it in a second, uh, assortative mating, where individuals who maybe are already kind of high on a trait tend to mate uh, together, you know, more often than not, uh, then you may actually have a gen general adaptive effect, but some of the offspring may actually overshoot <laughs> the boundary of adaptiveness and end up with too much of a trade for their own good and that might help. So those are three, um, yeah. We can talk more about that maybe later, but yes. So, uh, and of course, these, these processes apply in different ways to, of course, if you think of um, pure dysfunctions, okay, where a mechanism just breaks down and fails to perform the function, uh, there you can expect a larger role for, for example, you know, rare mutations just disrupt development. And, and in this case, oh, uh, for, for, keep doing this, please. <laughs> um, let me fix this. Okay, fixed at the source. Um, in the case of potentially adaptive strategies that uh, have, you know, undesirable consequences, it would be a completely different kind of genetic, and it could be, you know, not even selection against this necessarily. Okay. Now, how do you, how do you move from this to a level of integration? So my, my proposal, uh, has been to use some concepts from uh, life history theory. This is a, a broad area of, of uh, biology dealing with the basic problem of how organisms allocate resources, uh, including energy and time, to competing fitness components. Because, of course, you have to do a number of things to, uh, you know, for successful ultimate reproduction. Uh, organisms have to decide whether they want to put energy into growth and tissue repair and immunity versus reproduction. Um, when reproduction happens, um, species where there is mating have to decide whether they want to put further energy in uh, investing in the offspring and raising the offspring or further mating opportunities. Uh, there are trade-offs between reproducing now and risking maybe you know, dying later without having reproduced or waiting later, maybe there's a better chance of reproduction but you have to, uh, to invest some time in it. And then uh, quality versus quantity of offspring is not all the basic trade-offs. You can invest more uh, strongly in a fewer, you know, a smaller number of offspring or maybe, in a, and different species vary on all these dimensions. And in fact, if you look at cross species, this is just the picture for mammals. Uh, there's a, a pretty robust pattern that you find that's been called the fast slow continuum. And it is that there are some species at the slow end, they tend to be uh, also larger, but also you know, low mortality, long lifespan, low fertility, uh, and lots of investment, you know, energetic and time investment in the few offspring they produce. And then on the other hand, you have fast paced species with high mortality, you know, short lifespan, 
and uh, they tend to go for a, quality, a quantity over quality uh, kind of strategy. It's not all there is to life history strategies. There's, you know, it, there's a lot of complication, but this is a signal that comes through across pieces. And the uh, people in psychology and in biology have suggested that there might be something analogous going on at the level of individual differences, not just the, uh, about differences about, between species, but differences between individuals. And in fact, you know, because life history trade-offs, for example, between mating and parenting or early versus late reproduction have obvious implications for development and behavior, you might use this um, fast low continuum to the extent that you can recover it within species uh, at the within species level as a heuristic that based on functional reasoning for mapping individual differences. This is just, I won't go over the whole figure, but the idea is that if you work backwards here, you know, this is what, you know, life history models usually deal with, okay, uh, fitness rates like, you know, mortality and fertility, and then these are, are modeled assuming that they reflect trade-offs and allocation, for example, between current and future reproduction and different types of allocation organisms can make. Well, the way these allocations happen is not in the void. I mean, they are brought about by uh, behavioral traits, physiological traits, and, and morphological traits. So you can imagine that to achieve different trade-offs and balances between allocations, this will select for traits, for example, you know, in behavior, it could be you know, mating dispositions and things like impulsivity and risk-taking, where you're privileging you know, current rewards versus future rewards. Um, physiologically, all things from metabolism to growth to immunity are uh, involved ultimately in setting the balance between these trade-offs and determining life history outcomes. So while life history theory, the formal life history theory usually exists at, at this level here, it has you know, pretty straightforward implications for, I mean, sometimes that's straightforward, sometimes they're more complicated, but it has powerful implications for thinking about behavior, physiology, and, and morphology. And of course, you want to trace it back to development too. Okay, if you take this perspective now, that there are complications. And so um, let me just point you to a paper. <laughs> It's still, it should be published later this year. Uh, if you're interested in a broader view of all the, you know, potential, but also the complications of trying to move from the fast low continuum as a between species category to a within species category, you really want to read this paper uh, here, where I try to reconstruct the, the, whole, the logic of the, uh, of the transition and point out some difficulties. But, you know, if you look, for example, at human uh, personality traits and some, you know, traits that are kind of close to life history trade-offs like mating and sexuality patterns. Um, you do find, so this is one from one study we're analyzing right now, and um, this is just a correlation matrix a fancy, you know, with fancy colors, but it's pretty good. Uh, you can see that there are personality and behavioral traits that, for, that cluster okay, together in a pretty, in a pretty uh, consistent way, and they also predict things like uh, patterns of sexual behavior, they tend to correlate with patterns of early experiences. So you find, for example, that people with, you know, who report lots of family stress and early exposure to violence, they tend to be more, say, uh, less conscientious, more impulsive, taking more risk. They also tend to have more unrestricted so-called social sexuality, uh, earlier onset of sexual behaviors, more sexual partners, and so on and so forth. So it's not, it doesn't cover the whole of personality and behavior, but you can see, you know, there's a, there's a pretty strong signal coming in through the noise of all, all possible correlations between traits. And uh, the proposal is to think about this uh, signal that's coming through as an analogous of the fast low continuum that life history uh, theory talks about. Okay. Uh, and I specifically, you know, try to move beyond um, simple applications of this concept and to uh, refine what we think... Um, about traits that are associated with life is fast and slow life histories by taking into account some specific, specific aspects of human ecology. Sounds impressive. I don't, <laughs> that's because I don't have time to go into the details of the models and just showing you the, uh, the end result, which is basically there's something like a basic model in the field where most people agree that, for example, things like uh, impulsivity, risk-taking, sensation-seeking, uh, and say, uh, Precautious and unrestricted social sexuality versus restricted. Uh, probably some things having to do with affiliation and cooperation. Uh, you can map those traits in a, in a pretty reasonable way along this fast low axis. This is what I call the, kind of the basic model. It's basically because it, it reminds you of the work that's been done in biology. So it's basically about you know, impulsivity, time orientation, 
uh, more or less uh, aggression versus prosociality. You find this kind of thing in many, in many animals, kind of a basic uh, set of traits. However, in humans, things get a bit more complicated. And my proposal is that one way to think about it is to think of differentiated profiles within these broad uh, areas of fast and slow life history strategies. So for example, for um, just the, the, the brief version here is that for fast life history strategies that privilege mating over parenting investment and kind of early reproduction versus late reproduction, there's actually two ways of doing it. One is what you, you can find in uh, most other animals, which is just being uh, aggressive and exploitative and uh, yeah, <laughs> not cooperative and so forth. However, in humans, we have you know, interesting mating dynamics, including courtship, okay, including reciprocal courtship. So uh, for example, one way to get a lot of mating effort in humans is not necessarily to be an aggressive uh, jerk, forgive me the word, but it, it, you, know, you can obtain the, the same uh, fitness relevant outcomes uh, by, for example, being uh, just uh, very good at courtship or very interesting uh, at courtship and uh, getting your access to mates by these routes instead of an antagonistic competitive route. Um, we have, so in humans, courtship is a complicated and, and fascinating thing. For example, things like you know, creativity, including artistic creativity, they can be traced to some extent to uh, selection for, uh, for mating displays and so forth. So it's a very fascinating area. But you know, the bottom line is that I'm proposing that you have an alter kind of an alternative version of fast life histories in humans uh, where you can map some cognitive and personality traits uh, in, a, in a slightly uh, finer ways. For example, you would expect this what I label seductive creative profile to be associated with uh, increased uh, mentalistic cognition, which would be cognitive empathy, theory of mind skills, um, which are pretty good for courtship, and probably some verbal ability, especially verbal creativity, and less aggression than the standard model would have you believe as a, as a strong correlate of fast life history strategies. On the other, so you would, if you think of these as, yes. Sure. Yes. No, it's a fast law. Okay, uh, you start from this. So the the origin of that is in species differences along an axis that has to do with you know timing of development, timing of reproduction, and also mortality, so the, the lifespan. So that's where the fast law kind of uh, comes from. And the idea is to use this as you know it, it's partly an analogy, partly probably reflects some of the same trade-offs, but as an uh, as an organizer for individual differences. So the FAST would be basically, uh, biologically would be uh, people who, if you look at, you know, take a fitness perspective, what they're doing is uh, be enact, you know, behaviors and, and developmental patterns that maybe they mature a bit earlier. Although that's a bit, you know, that's a bit tricky in humans because we have such a long lifespan. So that's probably less critical, that's my argument. But they, you know, they, uh, their behavioral profile lead them to have, for example, initiate sex earlier uh, have, for example, more sexual partners rather than be more in a stable relationships, uh, invest less in children than would be otherwise for true about, of, yeah. Given that description, then yes. Why are you assigning this, um, yes. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, that would be, that would be, yeah, I mean, so the, the idea here is that you have a, let's say, a core of traits that you can map conceptually on this fast versus low distinction in humans. They have mostly to do, you know, impulsivity would be, if I have to choose one trait, would be impulsivity, probably. And that, you know, but it doesn't go along. I mean, impulsivity correlates with all sorts of, you know, motivational and uh, traits that relate to sexuality, decision making, uh, self regulation. And so the, you, you can think of a kind of a core of correlated traits that go in that direction. So the, this, the standard model, that's where it stops. And usually what, you, what people think about is, it's, you know, uh, it's a pattern of behavior that tends to favor, for example, aggression. If you're thinking of psychopathology, the externalizing disorders, you know, be aggressive conduct disorders. So, you know, psychopathy would be the, the, the prototype, this, the pathological prototype of this kind of, of pathway here. Uh, the suggestion is that in humans, that's not the only way to invest massively in mating effort at the expense of parenting effort. There's a different way that doesn't necessarily require aggression or directly to physical competition, I can go through uh, investment in, in courtship skills and uh, say, you know, mating displays. Yes. 
Okay. Uh -huh. Yep. Right, right, right. Okay, so cross species, I'm sure that ways are, are at this low end. Um, sure. I mean, uh, and then, I mean, how? Right. Sure. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I, it, you know. Sure. Oh, I see. Sure, I see where you're going. Well, I mean, um, okay. The, so the pattern is there. It's not like, you know, the traits are disconnected. So if you actually, you know, there's, uh, I think, pretty good evidence that, you know, these traits actually tend to go together in a certain way. Now, the question is, why do they go together in a, in a particular way? And this, so this approach is to try to use some functional reasoning to uh, link those traits to outcomes that are biological relevant, biologically relevant. So for example, you know, um, investment in mating versus parenting or timing of reproduction and, and things like that. Now, uh, if you're saying that the differences you see within a species are minimal compared with difference you see between species, I'm, you know, sure. No, I bet, of course, I mean, you know, it's thick lifespan of, you know, mammals. You have, you know, an enormous range, and for humans, you have a little, right. Yes. Yeah, it's not too, it's not too high, sure. I mean, it's not, it's not like you have, you know, uh, incredibly strong correlations, and partly because, of course, especially as you move from, say, personality dispositions to outcomes, like, you know, age at, you know, first intercourse. I mean, there's all sorts of additional factors that determine whether, you know, what's your age at first intercourse. It's not just a, a, a disposition. So it might depend on how, you, how attractive you are. Uh, it might depend on, you know, wh wh whether you're in a in an environment which are lots of potential mates or very few potential mates. It's going to depend on, you know, luck to some extent or chance factors. Actually, there's, you know, if you, if you uh, read that paper I suggested, actually, you know, there's a, uh, the more you move from dispositions to outcomes, the more stochastic factors will also, you know, play a role. And in things like lifespan, for example, if you're thinking of something lifespan or uh, total fertility, those are big, you know, demographic uh, measures. Uh, you can actually quantify how much of that is chance, like you know, randomness, versus you know, the proportion of variance you might potentially explain with individual factors. And for many species, for humans, I don't think we have great estimates, but for other species, usually you get you know, at least half, possibly more, of the variances, the traits, is, is basically chance events. So of course, what's left, you, you, you can never have really strong correlations from there because you know, a lot of these uh, you know, individual outcomes are going to be highly stochastic and so forth. I hope I, I mean, I need to, to move on, but we, you know, we can maybe circle back to this. Uh, so the, you know, starting to project this, I, I'm going to recover some time from, from question time, I guess. Uh, if you think of psychopathy as an instantiation of this kind of aggressive, exploitative, antisocial, um, cluster of traits. Uh, my suggestion is that traits like narcissism and uh, schizotypy, which be like low level predisposition to psychosis, uh, fit better with this kind of trait. So in, in a way, they're also, for example, associated with impulsivity. They're also associated with patterns of, patterns of sexual behavior in which you have more sexual partners and like earlier initiation of sex. But they don't have the same quality, for example, in terms of aggression and competition. And my argument is that they reflect, you know, the, the broader menu of reproductive strategies available to humans compared to other uh, organisms. On the slow end, again, you know, the standard approach here is to take this core list of traits. You have people who are, you know, low in impulsivity, they're future oriented, they have delayed and restricted social sexuality, they have, you know, stable attachment, affiliation, blah, blah. What that amounts to is uh, what I call a pro-social caregiving strategy, where you have, you know, lots of investment in uh, Close, you know, bonded relationships, possibly kind of more monogamous or at least, you know, stable couple relationships and uh, a strong pro-social orientation. However, again, in humans, there are indirect ways in which you can provide parental investment to your, uh, to your children. Not necessarily by uh, direct child care, but especially for men historically, it's been uh, by providing resources. And so uh, we have also, you know, uh, intergenerational transmission of resources through money and other, you know, uh, whatever, cattle, 
uh, other kinds of processions. So you, I mean, you can make an argument, which I won't make now, but I refer you to the book for the full version, that uh, on the slow end where parental investment predominates over mating, there's also two kind of two main ways of doing this in humans. And one is to do direct caregiving, have a highly pro-social kind of warm and affectionate kind of personality. On the other hand, you might have individuals who are the, you know, well suited to uh, stable relationship and provisioning, but don't have necessarily the high, say, empathy and, uh, and pro-sociality. And I would argue that uh, autistic-like traits actually fit this kind of, uh, of pattern here. And you could see, I'm going to come back to this in a second, how uh, psychotic traits and autistic-like traits in this model tend to fall on opposite side as kind of human-specific instantiation of broader reproductive trade-offs and reproductive strategies. So moving forward, okay, I'm, uh, I have some suggestions about neurobiology, which was tentative because the, you, know, you know how this uh, field works, but I'm suggesting that a serotonergic activity is probably the strongest uh, candidate for a correlate of the general dimension. But then you have, you know, you can make some you know, tentative statements about things like oxytocin, some uh, patterns of uh, kind of brain, uh, brain activity, general brain activity, and then things are even more tentative about dopamine, sex hormones, and so forth. So this is not to go in the detail, but it's just a way to say that this kind of model should at some point match the neurobiology. And I think there's some better candidates and some more tentative candidates, but that's the direction where you can, you can take it to. So it's not just about, uh, what I'm saying is not just about behavioral or personality traits. Okay, so that's the, the, uh, the model of individual variation. How do you get from there to psychopathology? Because we, we need to get there soon. Uh, the idea is that you have individual differences in this life history of related traits. Okay. You also have individual differences in the regulation of defensive mechanisms. Uh, and on the psychological side, this means you know, fear, anxiety, disgust, and, uh, and things like that, uh, which have a self-protective dimension. Okay, they can protect you against you know, physical danger or social dangers like ostracism and loss of status. You can protect you against pathogens and contaminations. Okay. Uh, those two things are not going to be the same. There's going to be some correlation between the two, which can uh, maybe explore later. And what I'm proposing is that from here, you have a number of etiological pathways that can lead you to what we <coughs> describe as disorder outcomes. And there are four main pathways to go from so this is really a map of how you go from individual differences to disorders, which is a very important step in psychopathology, which is you need to have something that links types of people to types of disorders, because clearly the two are not independent. There are strong correlations between psychopathology and personality. Uh, there are clusters of disorders that tell you that some people tend to get certain types of disorder rather than others. So you need an account ultimately of individual differences and disorders in the same, on the same plane. And uh, these are four ways in which this can happen, taking this perspective. The first thing is uh, some traits may be actually adaptive from a biological perspective, but be regarded as symptoms. So for example, you know, psychopathy has been suggested a number of times, might actually be a biologically adaptive strategy with all sorts of horrible social consequences, but still, as long as it leads to reproduction, uh, it, it could persist. Uh, aversive adaptive defenses, and then we talked briefly about that already. Uh, sometimes adaptive traits may be expressed at maladaptive levels. Uh, sometimes just because of, you know, combination of, of favorable genetic predisposition and environmental factors. Uh, sometimes assortative mating, so the tendency for sexual partners to resemble each other can actually um, push these to even more extreme, extreme um, levels. And this has been, you know, assortative mating has been shown for uh, antisocial type disorders, have been shown for uh, autism, spectrum disorder. So there are a number of disorders in which we actually have evidence that this is happening. And this is a mechanism that could keep pushing uh, toward maladaptive outcomes. Uh, also, adaptive strategy may yield individually maladaptive outcomes. That was something I alluded to. For example, learning or errors in defense activation. And finally, uh, adaptive traits might not cause disorders by themselves, but they might just predispose you to some kinds of dysfunctions versus others. So let's say you have, you know, people who tend, because of whatever, you know, genetic environmental uh, combination, to have a uh, easily trigger and, uh, and oversensitive reward system. That's not a dysfunction. That's not a disorder. But if you have that kind of pattern, you can imagine that some kinds of dysfunctions are more likely to happen to you 
if anything else goes wrong, uh, for example, infections or you know, high life stressors or whatever, then to some people with we, an uh, underactive reward system. So you know, uh, in this case, traits would be the background for these functions to happen and would shift the direction in which these functions take you uh, once you have uh, all sorts of issues. OK, now I'm going to, um, yeah, accelerate a little bit. So the, essentially what I'm proposing is that you can, not that much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, is it coming back? Okay, good. So the, you can start from this you know, general model of individual differences based on this uh, generalization of this fast versus low continuum and actually map, you know, start mapping disorders on it just based on for each disorder or s possible subtypes, you know, which of these traits tend to correlate with the disorders and then try to map them into clusters of comorbidity. In this case, uh, the idea is not just because of correlations between symptoms or some superficial similarity, but because they share some functional correlates. Um, and so the, the current system, you have you know, fast spectrum disorders that you can imagine you know, correlated with impulsivity, precocious sexuality, and so forth. So those spectrum disorders, and then what I propose as uh, defense activation disorders, and these would be disorders uh, in which the main symptoms are defensive processes that are either hyperactivated or activated for longer times than usual and so forth. Um, and the idea is that these, uh, these disorders here are not super strongly correlated with either uh, end of this dimension. Uh, they might be slightly more associated with fast spectrum disorders because, for example, uh, stressful and dangerous environments should tend to trigger both. Uh, but it's, it's really a third category here. Um, okay, let's skip some of the details, and I'm just going to show you in the current version of the model, which is, like a, as you can imagine, a big work in progress, how you would map the DSM, main DSM categories on this, uh, on this classification scheme. So for example, on the FAST, you know, the F-type disorder, you would have um, antisocial conduct, a subtype of eating disorders with high impulsivity, okay, and other, uh, and other correlates um, comorbidity with externalizing disorders, uh, borderline PD would, would be on this, uh, in this cluster. Uh, I'm proposing that a subtype of ADHD fits the description. Most psychosis spectrum disorder, which means uh, schizophrenia and bipolar, and also narcissistic personality disorder here, with some fine-grained distinction depending on the, on the subcategories. Uh, on this low end, I propose that uh, some eating disorders of a different kind with you know, more restrictive and high self-control and other traits like that actually fit you know, they, they split into two very functionally different categories. ADHD, I, I propose there's a subtype correlated with autism spectrum disorders, and they are, for mild cases, especially you, you end up on this side. Uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorders has many of the hallmarks that are proposing as, uh, as low spectrum disorders, and a subtype of OCD, because the other subtype of OCD goes here together with disorders that are the bulk of internalizing disorders. So, you know, depression, anxiety, PTSD, panic, and phobias. So, and again, I can't explain everything in detail. I just want to give you a sense of, of how this works. Uh, one thing I, I'd like to say is that this model, I mean, is it the lumping or, or a splitting model? And I'm happy to report that it's both, I think, because in a way, like the transdiagnostic models, it does, uh, you know, produce a classification that, uh, produces big clusters. Um, you, I'm really trying to account for the comorbidity patterns here. Uh, this is the, the main uh, job that this model is supposed to do. And the, in, on the other hand, and this is something that the transdiagnostic models don't really do, uh, there's also a splitting component because, for example, I'm proposing that, uh, say, OCD is not one kind of disorder that ends up in one category, but actually you understand OCD better if you split it into functional categories that actually have different correlates, different developmental intestines, and may actually correlate and co-vary with different kinds of disorders once you, uh, you split them properly. Okay, now I have one quick example about the autism spectrum. And again, I will just give you, um, let, me, let me skip to the, the important part. So this, uh, this model I'm proposing absorbed the uh, so-called diametrical model of autism psychosis proposed by Crespi and Badcock, and the idea that many of the, correlate, the cognitive correlates of psychosis and autism really are on a diametrical 
uh, spectrum from uh, you know spatial visual spatial abilities imagination uh, hyper activated inferences about others like you see in paranoia uh, versus underdeveloped theory of mind uh, there are also patterns of uh, growth if for example fetal growth that discriminate between autism on, on the one hand and psychosis on the other hand so that's a model and there's a there's a component to this about the role of uh, maternally and paternally inherited imprinted genes, which I will skip completely, but it's very interesting from a functional perspective. So the idea here, so this, uh, my model recovers the idea that psychosis is at one end and autism is at the other end of a continuum of sorts, and of course absorbs it into this fast versus slow distinction. Um, now, there's a couple of things that are relevant. For example, the, uh, there's a very good case, I think, that many of the features of, of autism can be viewed as uh, maintenance of childhood typical traits. And I, I, you know, look at Crespi's work, I think it made a very nice argument, which would, you know, fit in an interesting way with these fast versus low uh, trajectories. And also there's a uh, suggestion that um, one of the driver for the persistence and the emergence of autism could be as a byproduct of, of recent selection for uh, some particular kinds of cognitive skills, especially visual, spatial, and problem solving skills. Um, the genetics of autism is interesting and very complicated. Uh, one really interesting part of it is that uh, there seems to be a, a big role for deleterious mutations, especially though in low IQ, low functioning cases, but also a pretty big role for common variants, which are not necessarily maladaptive. There may be some positive selection for them, especially in the high IQ uh, variants of the disorders. So, um, what I'm proposing, okay, I have data uh, showing that if you look at autistic-like traits in the normal range, it's not in the disorder, but in people who have more or less than just the uh, low-level traits, they actually predict things that you would expect at the slow end of the continuum as I described it. For example, uh, more motivation for long-term mating, less investment in short-term mating, uh, less impulsivity and risk-taking. So that also fits the pattern. Um, and my proposal is that uh, you actually want to classify autism uh, spectrum disorders into two overlapping subtypes. One of them as a slow spectrum disorder with certain comorbidities, uh, a higher rate of, of males with respect to females and uh, some developmental correlates and some, uh, for example, associations with paternal age and so forth. Um, and then another subtype which mostly but not exclusively matches the more severe cases with intellectual disability that is really a different thing and I, I'm using this all type distinction to, to, to uh, mark that it's really outside the main classifications of the model. And my suggestion is that the slow spectrum version of ASD which is mostly in the mild, uh, mild uh, range is uh, really connected to a, a slow life history variant which we talked about earlier. Uh, some associations that you find like uh, early overgrowth, like fetal overgrowth, low intervals between pregnancies, which are surprisingly kind of risk factors for these disorders, may actually be reinterpreted as increased maternal investment in the context of slow life history strategies. And also, uh, the idea that this subtype of autism is not really adaptive or maladaptive per se, but there's a gradient, probably ranging from uh, potentially adaptive to frankly maladaptive when it, there's overexpression of these traits. On the other hand, this other type of autism, which is most associated with intellectual disability, is where you find the dysfunction, driven by rare mutations, developmental disruptions, and with no functional connections with the, with the slow. Of course, I mean, you can get both, so that's where the overlap comes. So you can have the, the uh, disruptive mutations and the personality background, personality traits. So it's not like they exclude one another, but okay. Now, here's the question, though. If you look at the genetic, and we're almost uh, there. If you look at the genetic data, uh, you see, a, a, not, a, not, a big, not a strong, there is a little positive correlation, though, between autism and psychosis at the level of, um, of uh, genetic, you know, genetic correlations from common variants, mostly. Um, so how does it fit with this diametrical model? Now, the interesting thing is that this is, so I'm proposing that this is probably something you want to explain. There might be some confounding effects, for example, of IQ and other, uh, you know, heterogeneity within the diagnosis. But I'm, I'm noting that there are data from the genetic studies that actually cast doubt on the idea that the positive correlation is telling you the whole story. For example, correlations with IQ at the genetic level are diametrical. 
schizophrenia, very, I'm not showing it here, but it has very you know, robust and consistent negative genetic correlations with IQ, and <coughs> autism has positive correlations with IQ. This is surprising and, and something people haven't really explained very well yet. Um, especially for the mild cases, for Asperger type, you have a you know, very robust uh, and, and consistent genetic correlation with higher IQ. There's a diametrical pattern of correlations, genetic correlations with risk-taking. So autism spectrum scores genetically correlated negatively with risk-taking. It's you know, small effects, of course, because it's very you know, massively confounded. But, and by, both bipolar and schizophrenia actually correlate with more risk-taking. And that fits the, um, the FSD model. And also, if you look at genetic associations with uh, sexual and reproductive patterns, you see that, for example, for ASD, there's a, this is not patients. This is the genetic score. Okay? It, it's correlated with uh, higher age at reproduction. And for schizophrenia, you have tendency to, to reproduce earlier with a, a little thing here that might suggest heterogeneity. And bipolar is a bit in, in between. So um, plus, if you take, there's one nice study where they derive this polygenic P factor. The P factor is the general factor of psychopathology, okay, where all disorders kind of correlate to the genetic level. But when they, instead of extracting one factor, they extract two factors, you see something very interesting, which is that uh, psychosis, schizophrenia, and bipolar just load on one of the factors, and autism loads on the other factors. So again, while this is not you know, <laughs> the ultimate demonstration that the diametrical model fits, is definitely an indication that this simple idea that autism and schizophrenia are kind of variants of the same risk predisposition is not telling the whole story. There might be some common factors, but there seem to be, th to be things that uh, go in opposite directions. Okay. Um, why does the transdiagnostic, classic transdiagnostic model differ so much from the FSD model I'm proposing? Um, and I actually, uh, I propose some pretty, um, you know, specific explanation. And one thing would be that if my approach is correct and DSM categories actually contain some, uh, some subtypes that are not just a bit heterogeneous but functionally disconnected or even functionally opposite, if you just take the overall scores and correlate them, you're not going to capture that. So your models are going to suffer from a lack of resolution. Also, a standard factor analysis, which is what is used to write these models, will miss nonlinear associations. And so, for example, if the proposal that uh, defense activation disorders are, the risk is elevated at both ends of the fast versus low continuum, that kind of association is, you know, curvilinear association is just not going to be captured by the standard factor analysis model. So you might miss that. And so the, the, the proposal I've been advancing is that this P factor is a statistically robust phenomenon, but at a substantive level, it's actually an artifact which combines uh, fast life history predispositions, let's say, uh, a tendency to defense upregulation reflected in high neuroticism, and also low cognitive ability and low level neurological dysfunction. Um, this is a bold statement, because people in the, in the transdiagnostic literature, they tend to take the p-factor at face value. Uh, so do I have any evidence that the p-factor may be a statistical entity that emerges from independent or functionally independent dimensions of variation? And to, I don't have, you know, I can't have, it's hard to show, but what I, I could do was a simulation study in which I simulated patient data based on my model, okay? The simulation based on the life history model. Then you create, you know, uh, symptom scores for a s virtual sample of, uh, of patients. And then what you do is you just analyze it with factor analysis in the way people are analyzing the real world symptoms. And lo and behold, there was a nice study. What you get is the best fitting model has an externalizing factor, an internalizing factor, and a P factor. And none of them is embedded in the generating model. So at least it's a demonstration that if my model is right, what you would get by factor analyzing it is something that resembles the classic, you know, what you find in the real world uh, pretty closely. Okay, so thanks for staying with me through this long presentation. My conclusion is that uh, an evolutionary approach informed by a life history perspective may, you know, may help overcome fragmentation in psychopathology in a functional way, not just a, uh, like a superficial or descriptive way. Um, this framework I presented provides the foundation for an alternative classification system, which you know, I'm doing more work to test and try to apply to uh, more disorders. Um, this model at least succeeds in reproducing the large scale structure of mental disorders. So we don't know if that means that it is the right explanation, but at least it's consistent with the data as you find them in real populations. 
and uh, there's potential for deeper integration with you know, be, you know, behavior genetics. I just show you some data that might be interpreted in this way, but also study of individual differences and, and computational models. I think you know, there's potential for giving a, uh, a layer of ecological validity to the uh, computational model, which usually suffer from a bit of abstraction um, in the way they're formulated. And we haven't considered this, but there are interesting implications for epidemiology, for example, environmental risk factors, how would they map on different types of disorders, and also developmental psychopathology, because you can link some of these uh, individual differences pattern to patterns of development, for example, maturation and, and developmental milestones and so forth. And with this, I thank you for your attention.